Hello, dear friends. The subject of today's video is the memories of Soviet veterans. This video can be described as Soviet veterans telling their most memorable story from World War II. Their stories are so different, but they all have their own uniqueness. Don't forget to rate this work and leave your opinion in the comments. And here we go. Bozbatai Zhakupov recalls, It was my first fight. In the beginning, German dive bombers were bombing our trenches. I still don't know where that terrifying sound was coming from. That hideous howl that sort of pulls you out of the trench. Then the bombs were falling from above. It seemed to me that the next bomb would fly toward me, stick in my head, go through my whole body, reach my pelvis and explode there. It would tear to pieces my body, carefully crafted by my mother. And then we saw the tanks coming. Three tanks. They were coming at me. It seems to us that the bulky tank slowly crawls across the battlefield, but in reality, the tank moves rapidly, so fast you can't hear the noise of the tracks. With every breath you take, these tanks increase in size. I also remember that I couldn't breathe. I breathed in air, but for some reason I couldn't exhale. I also remember that it felt like the tanks were only coming at me. I also remember how I pulled the pin of the grenade, it damaged the track of the tank, and then stepping through the Molotov cocktail. The tank started burning. Then I looked for the rifle, grabbed the bottle, and threw it at the tank. I met Stepan in 1952. The conversation turned to the first battle. Stepan couldn't remember how he threw the Molotov cocktail into the tank, and I remember his every move distinctly, including how he fell to the bottom of the trench after the throw. Stepan told me how I first threw a grenade toward the tank, then threw my rifle and started to pick up his assault rifle, but got punched in the teeth. Then I ran to my place, about six meters between us, and threw my Molotov cocktail into the burning tank, then crawled after my rifle. Desperate Guys For four days, our guys bombed German airfields, each time returning without three or four crews. It didn't come close to the target, because the enemy anti-aircraft guns had experienced personnel, and were cleverly set up, and from the neighboring airfields, fighter jets were already taking off. So after dropping bombs wherever they could, our guys hurried back. On the fifth day, the general and his suite arrived and made a huge row. He ordered to fill the aircraft with as much ammunition as possible and to put a special agent in every aircraft without a parachute and a grenade. As a result, the German airfields were bombed to smithereens and seven crews were lost. Galim Khan Akhmukhamadov's Memories there was a soldier named Vasily Evsievich Karpov in our platoon, an absolutely bald man with a filthy swearing speech, at times incomprehensibly silent, but in business he was always fierce as a bullet. Karpov's orders were carried out by us swiftly and accurately, and the orders of the platoon commander were carried out after coordination with Vasily Evsievich. The company commander tried to change the situation in the platoon. He even sent a petty officer with experience and two wounds but Karpov was smarter and wiser. We accomplished all combat missions with few losses, fought competently, and were constantly inventing something. But the platoon commander Karpov Vasily Evsievich didn't have the best biography. He was the son of prosperous peasants, repressed by the Soviet authorities, and was brought up in an orphanage. Tuluspayev recalls, At the time, we were liberating Ukraine. It was getting dark. When we were already approaching the village, we stopped in a grove without putting up a combat outpost. The Germans took out two armored carriers. We didn't see them, so we will not fight. We had been continuously attacking for the third day, and in the protracted battles, we lost half of the battalion. We had a snack and went to bed. In the morning, the Germans loaded into the armored vehicles and silently drove past us. The machine guns were under the covers, and nobody stood behind them, and we were asleep. Our commander was an old soldier and knew very well that during war, men must rest. Otherwise, it would be impossible to maintain discipline. You could not tell such things to the young people. They could think that we used to shoot and throw grenades all day and night. They should not even guess that often we used to let the enemy go, taking away their weapons. Konstantin Sergeyev recalls. In August 1941, on the territory of the Kustanai Chemical Fiber Plant, they placed a shell factory. The approach to the placement was very simple. They poured concrete foundations and installed machine tools in an open area. I was appointed foreman of the workshop, 
16 lathes and a diesel generator were at my command. The lathes were running non-stop around the clock. In October, we sheltered the machines from the rain with sheds, and from November on, the machines were lubricated with spindle oil, otherwise they wouldn't work in the cold. We were given a large room in an old red brick building. While half of the turners worked, the other half ate here, washed and slept. A worker who brought materials from the warehouse said, if the boys work outside all winter, they won't live long. In the heat of the summer, the boys started dying. The director ordered a group of students to be recruited, put them to the machine and give them a good food supply. How glad they were of their new fate and of our trust. Hunger was no longer a threat to them. My boys worked well and kept the plan. They were 15 and 16 years old. Three winters after the machines worked in the cold, more than a hundred of my boys were buried in the Kustanai City Cemetery. It wasn't until the summer of 1944 that the machines were put under the roof, where it was warm. Bozbatai Zhakupov recalls, We passed 15 kilometers, and we were ordered to make a halt. The whole battalion ran into the forest to go to the toilet there. We were sitting anywhere, not really choosing the place, smoking slowly and talking. Tartar Rashid laid burdocks on a fallen tree and sat down very seriously. He kept silent for a pro forma. Said that he can't remember his aunt's face. I, too, successfully tried to remember, but couldn't. My concerned neighbors raised their voices, and among them were some who couldn't remember their parents' faces. We reached a silent verdict. Rashid was the cleverest among us. From the battalion, which remained a miserable bunch of 80 soldiers, we, after 20 days of continuous attacks and bombardments, went to reconstitute the battalion. Constantine Dukanin recalls, Our unit was in Romania. The war was raging somewhere far away, and we had already moved on to a peaceful life. The predominance of the female population, even after our arrival, was quite strong. Romanian women found themselves in interesting positions, but this didn't lead to scandals or complaints to the Commandant's office. In the midst of this abundance of passion, I saw an Adler bicycle. Its owner, an old man, didn't want to part with this beauty. I went to see him in the morning. In the evening, at noon, the bike wasn't for sale. Months later, the old lady brought me the bike because this old man had fallen off his bike and could no longer ride it. Before I was sent home, I asked the secretary of the administration to write a certificate saying that, in honor of the liberation of his country, a Romanian citizen was giving me a bicycle as a sign of the great friendship between the nations. At all the transfers, demobilized soldiers were thoroughly checked, and all civilian possessions were seized. They studied my certificate very thoroughly. It was written in Romanian, and you couldn't read it without an interpreter. And I told them firmly that it was a gift, as a sign of the great friendship of nations, and they believed me. For five years, I had been riding my Adler bicycle around my hometown, and it had been stolen near a store. Only the chain and lock were left. I saw my bike seven years later near the police building. It was even more beautiful. It must have fallen into caring hands. An ensemble from Moldova came to my city, and I told them the story of the bike. They translated this old certificate for me. It said, One old idiot sells this thing, and the other guy buys it. Which of them is smarter? Only God knows. All this was certified by the seal of the veterinary hospital. Sergei Prokopenko recalls, We watched the Germans all day long and found a junction between the positions of two of their units where there was absolutely no complete solid line of defense. Between two machine guns, there was a hundred meters of well-shot space without a combat outpost, where it was possible to crawl into the back of the enemy at night and seize the Germans for interrogation. Soldiers of our company, Moldavan, Vladnoi Biaja, Prostoi Biaja, they are brothers from Odessa, Nagatok, and Senior Lieutenant Jurovlev were equipped for reconnaissance. The battalion commander silently hit the Moldavan and took his kettle, spoon, and flask. We checked the time, verified the landmarks of the time of exit, checked the uniforms again, and drew lots with the matches. The senior lieutenant went ahead. Two German machine guns started firing from both sides. Flares flew into the sky, and our group was on its way. The next day, at the appointed hour, we fired two flares and began firing from both sides to divert the attention of the Germans from the place where a group of our men should cross into their territory. That night, we didn't wait for our reconnaissance group. Again, we set up and equipped a new group as last time, fired from both sides. The Germans responded by firing two machine guns. Flares were fired into the sky, and the group went. But ten minutes later, returned back, with a German and a Moldavan. 
the battalion commander came, and after that, the captive was sent urgently to the division headquarter, but Moldavin absolutely refused to answer the commander's questions and drank all the water we had. He said he neither drank nor ate for two days. We brought him something to eat quickly. He didn't eat as usual. He didn't smack greedily and took his time. Moldavin began to tell. We reached the road without incident, settled down in the bushes, waited long for our chance, and caught the liaison soldier who was passing on a bicycle. He didn't show resistance. The senior lieutenant ordered them to tie up this German and sit by themselves in the bushes. All day long, the Germans were moving in a thin chain along the edges of the forest without entering the open ground and were hiding, amassing in the nearest small forests. The movement of tanks, self-propelled vehicles, armored personnel carriers, and tractors with guns began the moment it started to get dark. According to the senior lieutenant, there were now two infantry divisions, 70 tanks, 40 self-propelled vehicles, about 200 armored personnel carriers, and about 50 guns against our battalion. When we were crawling over, the Germans noticed us, but they didn't shoot, but blinded us with the headlights of the armored vehicles. I turned right with the German. Thank him. He helped me. He was smart, and he went into the ravine, and that saved us. The German turned out to be a coward. He kept silent all the way, didn't resist, and the Germans were pushing from behind. When you started firing, we lay down and crawled. On the same night, the Germans used night battle tactics. Our battalion had only six small caliber guns, so they destroyed the battalion's position in seven minutes. It was an element of suddenness. The Germans hadn't fought at night before. Moldavin and I were captured by the Germans. I was contused, and he was covered with earth. They dug him up by some miracle. The Germans didn't guard us. We were shown the direction by hand, waving to us, and we marched thirty or forty men in a line of two as if we were going to reconstitute our battalion. On the way to our column, Vladnoi Biaja and Prostoi Biaja joined to us by the Germans. From them, we learned that the senior lieutenant and the Nogatok had been shot by the Germans because they had found a Komsomol membership card and a party membership card in their pockets. By lunchtime, we came out to a large field. There was a German military field kitchen with two large cauldrons. We were fed and sent on our way. After lunch, we escaped, and the rest of the column walked meekly into the German back. I still can't give an explanation for this phenomenon. Maybe they were on their way in search of peace and quiet. We were led to ours by Blotnoi Biaja. By evening, we reached a lonely village, where we got food and an assault rifle. The old man and the old woman pointed out the direction of movement with the only landmark, a lake covered with reeds on its shores. We went around it, walked another three kilometers, and found our people. We were sent to the back at once. The man from Altai who was accompanying us was in no hurry. On the way, we had a good sleep, ate, and went to the village of Lutovo. The grumpy sergeant, after reading our documents, sent us onward to the village of Arkhipovka, which we didn't reach until the next day. The lieutenant with completely white eyebrows looked both scary and fantastically comical. He asked us at length where we had put our weapons, how we had ended up in German hands, and how long they had held us captive. Then he let us go in peace, giving us each a corresponding document. After wandering around the rear for three or more days, our sly accompanying man led us back to the location of his company, saying, Fools, even though you are hungry, the most important thing is that you are alive. In somebody else's platoon, we were often sent to take the wounded fighters out of the battlefield, to do night reconnaissance by force. This happened in the following way. The three of us crawled to the German trenches and threw grenades to where we could hear German voices, and then, like rainy worms, we were screwed into the ground because the shooting from both sides was terrible. The commander at this time was detecting enemy machine gun points. After a couple of weeks, the German breakthrough was eliminated, the front was leveled, the enemy was thrown back, and we were sent to restructure. After the war, we met several times with our fellow soldiers, and when we were asked what our battalion was famous for, we answered that the battalion had been killed by delaying the enemy offensive by seven minutes. After my demobilization in October 1946, I returned to my native village, found a friend, and met my life partner. I raise two sons and three daughters and work in the carpool. I am awarded three military and two labor orders, but my most dear award is the medal for courage for that seven-minute unequal battle. Memories of Konstantin Subota A grenade flew from the German trench, hit the parapet, and fell at my feet. Matve and I stood as if paralyzed. We were terrified. Our mouths dropped open. I kicked the grenade away from me. It ended up behind Matve, under Mitya, and immediately exploded. 
The shrapnel shattered my bone below my knee. Matvey and Mitya were killed at once. I had the right to self-preservation. In a country that had crossed out God, only fear remained. No one can condemn me for that. I think differently now. The only thing I lacked in order to become a human being was time. We went to war as 17-year-old boys. That is all for today. If you like the video, then support it with a like and the channel with a subscription. Goodbye. See you all later.